London newsagents. This payment, this settlement that was paid to an academic after the science secretary, Michelle Donnellan, had falsely accused them of supporting Hamas. A settlement of £15,000 has been paid by the taxpayer. Did you approve that? Um, I don't think I did because uh, the Chancellor only approves much larger sums of money. But it is normal practice that uh, government lawyers support government ministers in legal cases that brought against government ministers in the course of their duties. And it was paid, I think, to reduce the cost that would be incurred to the taxpayer if there was a protracted legal case. Michelle Donnellan, the science secretary, close ally of Rishi Sunak. It's been revealed that some of your taxes have been used to pay her legal bills after she libeled an academic, falsely accusing them back in October of being a Hamas sympathizer and of publishing extremist content. This week, Donlan's department published a letter withdrawing the claim, deleting her original post and fully accepting that Professor Sang was not an extremist, a supporter of Hamas or other prescribed organisation. That is all pretty extraordinary in itself. A Secretary of State libelling someone. But, as I say, guess who is on the hook for the out-of-court settlement believed to be £15,000? That's right. You, me, the taxpayer. It's Lewis here. Welcome to the news agents. I think most people watching this would be aghast. The government is telling them every day that they can't do any more to help them. People are really struggling to pay their bills and the government says we can't afford to help you anymore. People know their public services are crumbling. And then you've got a minister who says something she shouldn't have said, then has to pick up a legal action and pay damages and costs, and then says the taxpayer's going to pay for that. Totally insulting. We need a change. I'll tell you something else. If we're privileged enough to come into power and have a Labour government, we will never allow that sort of thing to happen. That will be history. That was Keir Starmer expressing his indignation that Michelle Donnellan's tweet had cost us all money. Donnellan's departmental shadow, Labour's Peter Kyle, went further still. He tweeted, Will the Tories ever hit rock bottom? Rishi Sunak promised integrity, yet is a bystander as his science secretary gets taxpayers to pay for false allegations against a scientist. Michelle Donnellan should be embarrassed, apologise and repay taxpayers. At the time of recording, there is no sense that she might do so. And it poses a wider question as to why she did it in the first place and what it says about Conservative Party psychology, its mode of politics right now. And we'll come to that. But before, let's get a sense of where the politics is going and more about what the story is about. Natasha Clark, LBC's political editor, is with us. It's really, it's such a curious case. So Michelle Donnellan, she's the Science and Technology Minister, and we've just found out yesterday that taxpayers have had to pay out £15,000 to settle a libel case that she was involved in when last year, after the October the 7th attack, she tweeted about an academic accusing her of being a Hamas supporter. She's now had to withdraw that From claim. her own private account, her own Twitter From account. From her own Twitter account. Obviously, as a cabinet minister, she would have been involved in some of these investigations, I presume, into this academic. And, she, yeah, because she is the responsible minister, right? Exactly. So, yeah, and it comes... Minister. Exactly. As 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 the uh, science and tech minister, she would have been involved in this because this academic was part of this uh, government-funded body called UK Research and Innovation. And that is what uh, Dr Catherine Sang was a part of. And essentially, she accused her of being a Hamas supporter. It then transpired that it was completely not true. She had to withdraw that claim. She's had to apologise and tweet that this is completely untrue. Now, just four months later, we are now finding out that it's cost the taxpayer £15,000. And it's very, very curious because Number 10 are today standing by her. Government ministers now coming out to defend her. We've been hearing from Penny Mordaunt, the Commons leader, just in the last few minutes as well. She has stood by her as well. Now, it's fair to say they are friends. She actually supported her in the leadership contest. Well, so they we, are quite Should we close. just listen to that clip? I think we've got it. So let's listen to this Penny Mordaunt, as Natasha said in the Commons. I would just remind the House because what the Honourable Lady says gets uh, is really probing the character of uh, that Secretary of State. And I would remind this House that when the Honourable Lady was entitled to redundancy payments from uh, being a Secretary of State, uh, she did not, uh, which was £16,000, she did not take that and handed it back to the Department because it was the right thing to do. So I would just remind people of that, and I think that speaks 
volumes about the Honourable Lady's character and how much she values uh, the fact that it is taxpayers' money that we are talking about. <laughs> so, what she, so what Penny Morden's saying there is that when she uh, chose not to take her redundancy payment, she chose not to take 16 grand. So in effect, in effect it just we all owe her, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If anything, we're still a grand up. Exactly. Um, uh, yes, I thought it was really interesting that she says it vouches for her good character and that she cares about taxpayer value for money. The fact that she gave back her redundancy payment, because let's not forget, that was she nice was, that. That was, was so advice. kind. Thank you so much. She gave it back um, after she was education secretary for about five minutes. I think it was under the Liz Truss government. That was generous. Very Jeez, generous of her. But yes, it's, it's such an interesting case, Lewis, because it doesn't have any precedent that I can remember. And I don't know whether I'm wrong or you can remember any uh, mm. example of a, a cabinet minister facing any legal action in this way, let alone a libel action. And as the former culture secretary, she really should know a thing or two about libel laws in this country. And to post that letter on Twitter to thousands of followers without having any substantiated claims, was that her? Was that officials in her department that advised that she do that, that she hit out at this body and obviously in the wake of the Hamas attacks on October the 7th tensions were obviously incredibly high you'd think she really would have double checked you'd think the officials in the department would do so but again now why the taxpayer are, is now on the hook for this payment now there obviously is a little bit of precedent with the taxpayer paying out for cabinet ministers to do things in the duty of their job so the Covid inquiry for example the cabinet office are funding all of the legal action for sure, yeah. cabinet ministers who have to uh, justify their decisions in the Covid inquiry and actually, obviously, you'll remember Boris Johnson's party gate legal fees were as well covered by the Cabinet Office. I think that was around £265,000, which were paid out by taxpayers' money as well. A lot of money. This was an out-of-court settlement. The government today are going, well, actually, we settled it out of court. So actually, it's a far, it's far less than it would have been if it ever went to court. And yes, all snuck out yesterday during the budget while all of us were looking at the budget doing something else. It all really, really stinks. And this would usually be a resigning matter for any other minister, you'd think, right? And, what's number, and number 10 are sticking by her as well. They're sticking by her today saying, that essentially there is a precedent because they say that this is something that the minister did within her role as the science and technology minister. They say there is precedent under multiple administrations that if you're doing this sort of work, they say, you know, that you should be protect protected by uh, government lawyers and by the taxpayer, which just, just seems to not add up to me. Well, I suppose because there is a difference. Government ministries get sued all the time by people or they get taken to judicial review and the Secretary of State is always the person who is ultimately either the defendant in court or whatever it happens to be. But that is them in court as their job. Exactly. Whereas this was something that she did not have to do, that mm -hmm. she chose to do just because for whatever reason, it's hard to get inside her head and, mm. and know exactly what she was thinking, but she elected to do it. Mm. And yes, it's understand from the, from the government today, it sounds like she did take advice from her officials. If that is the, before making this tweet and before putting this out, if that indeed is the case, why on earth was this allowed to go through this level of not being rigorously checked before it was tweeted out and before she wrote in a letter to the UK body to urge her for an investigation? Now the professor in question had a, four-month investigation into this. Yeah, I was then... say, this must have been pretty traumatic and difficult for the uh, academic concern. Exactly, the academic involved. And then after four months, she then was forced to withdraw the comments after this lengthy investigation. It took her four months to defend and then delete those comments. Because there is something, isn't there, just finding this out, there is something kind of, I can imagine if you're that person, there is something a bit sinister about a Secretary of State who is ultimately the minister responsible for your job or at least the sort of industry in which you work in this case an academic Michelle Donnellan responsible for universities as Secretary of State calling you out on her account and saying that this is, and this is not just like a columnist or like a, a random bot or whatever it happens to be or a, or a celebrity or whatever this is the Secretary of State pointing at you and saying you are this you are a Hamas sympathiser mm. and you should be dealt with accordingly that's exactly. pretty sinister it is as well and to be fair it's all come out from the hard work of a journalist at the I newspaper called Poppy Wood who uncovered all of this she also uncovered what uh, she claims to be possible links to the policy exchange think tank which called out some of these academics for their potential links uh, and extremist links beforehand as well so that was also an, an, another interesting layer and it does sort of tap into what you think firstly the influence of Westminster think tanks like policy exchange might be on cabinet ministers and obviously their links to them um, but also does it tap into sort of some sort of wider culture war issue here when we're talking about the extent that we can attack people because they work for you know bodies like the UK Research Innovation Council which are obviously government funded and of course should be scrutinised but the fact that you've got cabinet ministers calling them out without significant backing or any sort of proof for this it's really a bit of a shocking case and again the fact that taxpayers money 
money is being used to pay for it. Now, Labour and the Liberal Democrats calling for the Prime Minister's uh, ethics investigator to get involved and to look at a probe. But today, number 10 standing by that, refusing to get drawn on whether uh, Laurie Magnus, I think he is the ethics investigator, would look at investigation into him. But yes, it just it just stinks to me. And I think many people will just look at this and just go, why should we as taxpayers be paying out for a minister's libel bill? Should that not be something that she herself should be paying for? Well, I suppose, Natasha, the best thing that could happen to you on your birthday is that the government minister libels you about something and you could get a nice little payout from... You could end up with 15 Great birthday drinks on me. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great. See you down the pub later. <laughs> Natasha, thank you. Right, I suppose one of the things we have to understand is to answer that question that Natasha and I were just discussing. Is there a good precedent for it? Is this out of line with what has happened in the past? Well, Alex Thomas is a programme director at the Institute for Government, the civil service think tank, and I'm sure he will know. Thanks so much for joining us. How much th- this when I heard this, for my part, I was thinking I can't think of really of too much of a, an equivalent case such as this. Is there much of a precedent? There is. It's it's pretty rare, but it does happen. I mean, probably the most recent time we were talking about you know, legal fees and whether the taxpayer should pay for them or not was with Boris Johnson when he was uh, doing the Partygate inquiry with the Privileges Committee. Um, there was quite a hoo ha. Um, back then about whether because he had he had instructed lawyers for his appearance before that committee there was quite a hoo ha about whether he should have those should have been paid for by the taxpayer or not it also goes it goes all the way back to you know the the modern precedent for this if you like was set by Norman Lamont when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer um, uh, and there were media reports that he'd let one of his flats to a sex therapist um, and the taxpayer ended up paying um, his uh, uh, the for, for the lawyers to um, uh, to defend his reputation on that which was uh, I think most people involved uh, would admit was um, uh, you know slightly beyond the line. So there are some historic uh, parallels but most of this in one form or another you could argue and I think that number 10 is pointing to you today basically goes back to Boris Johnson's time in number 10. Yes, and he was, um, you know, and, and the government sort of stoutly defended then that, um, that he should uh, have public support for his um, legal fees. I think there are a couple of differences between that um, that case and this mm. one, though. Um, and they actually, to my mind, work in Michelle Donnellan's favour because Boris Johnson, firstly, he was appearing in front of a parliamentary select committee. That's not a court of law. Um, that's not a legal case. So pretty unusual for a minister uh, or an ex-minister to have um, uh, lawyers at all, let alone them to be publicly funded. And the second, to my mind, you can debate this, but that this was about that was about Boris Johnson's personal conduct in, you know, whether he'd partied or let parties uh, happen. Um, this you can you can dislike what Michelle Donnellan did, but it does relate to um, her job as a minister. So uh, I think number 10 are on slightly stronger ground on that one. But isn't the precedent for this, Alex, that basically government ministers can libel who they like and that we have to pick up the tab? And I think there is a question there about, you know, ministers' judgment and whether, um, you know, whether a minister has exercised proper judgment, whether they've looked to the evidence. Um, I think that is, uh, you know, that is a question for the prime minister and you get into kind of questions of ministerial code and so on. Um, I think the... uh, precedent the other way is that if a minister if you know something a minister says in connection with their job um they could be personally liable for i think that would have a damaging effect the other way so you know it is a judgment it's a balance uh, ultimately it's for the accounting officer and the permanent secretary in a government department to make that um, alex as part of her job was it a necessary component of her job to tweet this about this person I mean, no one was expecting her to do so. She didn't need to do so. She elected to do so. Yeah, it wasn't a necessary component at all. And I would not defend what she did for one uh, for one moment. I, you know, I disagree with that. I think it was um, uh, a, a poor judgment. Um, but ministers do things that they don't have to do the whole time. Um, uh, and the question for the critical question for me is, is it in connection with her role as a minister? And you could argue that this uh, is. I think it's a you know, I do think it's arguable. Um, but, you know, clearly that's where that's where the permanent secretary and the government have come out. Do you think that there is a question mark over whether she may have breached the ministerial code? I think there is a question mark over that. And the code does require you to be objective. It requires you to use evidence properly. Um, and um, uh, it does you know, talk about you know, responsible conduct in uh, the performance of your duties. I think that's the debate that is actually more important. Um, we've talked you know, lots of times about the ministerial code. Again, you get back to questions of judgment and one of the uh, you know, judge and jury questions about the ministerial code is it's ultimately for the prime minister um, to determine. Um, but I do think, I think those are the 
questions that are um, most uh, important and difficult for Michelle Donnellan to answer, other than in this case, where the public funding for her um, legal fees came from. And so you think it could be useful? There's no, I don't think there's any particular indication the Prime Minister is minded to do this at the moment, the time of a recording, but that Laurie Magnus, his advisor on uh, standards, should be called in to assess the case. It would be a good idea. I think it's um you know that's that, that's what Laurie Magnus is is there to do uh, uh you know it's uh, what, what we've argued one of the flaws in this, that system is that um Laurie Magnus um can't um uh, do enough to initiate his own inquiries uh and so yeah it would be it would be better if that judgment was in the hands of an independent um person rather than with the prime minister themselves but political reality is it will always be as we saw with Boris Johnson down to the prime minister to make a call as to whether they want to keep this person on or not. Alex, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Right. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Alex. I don't actually believe that these Islamists have got control of our country, but what I do believe is they've got control of Khan and they've got control of London. We are going to have, you know, a serious, serious Islamist force in Parliament by 2029. There's going to be a by-election in the next few weeks, and it could be a radical Islamic party win in that by-election. So that is a possibility. You're saying Islamic radical party in a couple of weeks in a special election. Is it one of these Midland urban uh, areas that has a... Rochdale. Islamist extremists and the far right feed off and embolden each other. They are equally desperate to pretend that their violence is somehow justified when actually these groups are two sides of the same extremist coin. Those are just a few examples of senior Conservatives talking about Islamism or Islamist forces on the march, literally and metaphorically, in Britain. We've had MPs talking about Gaza marches as being full of Islamists. We've had Nigel Farage and Liz Truss hinting or stating that Britain could soon have a radical Islamist party being elected to Parliament. We've had a former Home Secretary suggesting Britain's state is controlled by Islamism and Lee Anderson that Labour and Sadiq Khan is. And it's just worth, perhaps at this point, remembering what the definition of Islamism is. That is, quote, an advocate or supporter of Islamic fundamentalism, a person who advocates increasing the influence of Islamic law in politics and society. Now, if that's the definition, it seems hard to equate that with much of what the Conservatives have been talking about. There has been a greater and greater moral and political panic on the right of politics in Britain, especially since October the 7th, about the threat that Islamism might pose, that in some senses it is ubiquitous or behind every corner. I think that that is at least partly the prism through which you have to see the Donaldson story. Part of this rising, at times you could even say McCarthyite, suspicion of Islamism, which some worry is a synonym, really, for concern about Muslims more generally, or simply Islam's compatibility with Western society, which is something spoken about more and more on the right. Now, to think about all of that, we're joined by Sundar Katwala, director of British Future, a think tank which specialises on integration, identity and race, and he's very thoughtful about all of these matters. Sundar, where do you think this interest in and the sort of normalization of the conservatives talking about islamism so consistently rather than you know islamic related terrorism or whatever it is but islamism as a force within our society where do you think it comes from well i think challenges of extremism and islamist extremism in particular are obviously extremely prominent um you know after 9 11 after 7 7 a generation ago and were absolutely central to politics and uh, policy then on countering extremism that that has ebbed rather um o- over time you know there are still threats out there um from terrorists they they haven't been successful that's been contained and we've been having other debates i think about identity and integration and so british muslims as a group and islamist extremism in particular has been you know a persistent threat and challenge but not dominant in our in our public in our public life the last few months since October the 7th there were about an international conflict um, in the Middle East. There's also about how it feels in Britain. There's a spike in anti-Semitism, there's a spike in anti-Muslim prejudice. There's a contested debate about what is protest, what is persuasion, what is intimidation, what is prejudice. Um, and it's particularly around um, groups that aren't just Muslim, 
but that are particularly interested in Palestine. So that's what's that's what's brought the challenge back as to inclusion, integration, extremism within Muslim communities. I think it's always helpful to try and have a consistent approach that if there's an extremist threat in any community, we're tackling it in a similar way. The white far right, Islamist extremism, other groups, the threats might wax and wane. Three quarters of the threat from security and terrorism comes from Islamist groups, about a quarter from uh, the, the sort of far right, white British far right. But you want a consistent approach between groups. What to call it has always been complicated because you know you you need to separate Muslim society from extremist threats within that community from extreme Islamist viewpoints. But there does seem to have been a a change, though, doesn't there, I would say, in the last few weeks a, a month in terms of the way some Conservatives, particularly on the right of the party, but more broadly as well, are talking about it. Because as you say, we might have once talked about the threat of Islamic extremism or Islamist extremism, Islamist-related terrorism, whatever it happened to be. But now we've got very senior figures from within the Conservative Party, including someone like Suella Braverman, suggesting that Islamists are in control of organs of the state or of parts of British society. That is different, surely. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very hyperbolic, uh, exaggerated claim. And what, what I think we see going on there is there's, a, there's another story about, you know, wokeness and liberal elites and metropolitan elites, cosmopolitan elites, different claims like that from Brexit, from, uh, you know, racism debates that is now being combined with an earlier threat and challenge, Islamist extremism. There isn't some kind of woke Islamist coalition going on in the civil service, you know, inviting the wrong people to speak and, you know, mm. organising against ministers. So it's, I think, I think that is a sort of, you know, everyone's against us, the poor embattled government of the day, you know, finding that other people are in charge and conflating all of these arguments. That is not credible. The question of whether or not institutions of the state, you know, are cognizant enough of who's within the boundary, who's over the boundary, and what do you do when people are. That that is always a challenge on on any boundary of of extremism. But it's not that people are in charge. What you know, the credible challenge if you want to make one from the Conservative right is that, you know, has the Mayor of London or the Home Set Office got control of policing, not that they're in control of extreme groups. There's nothing there's nothing to suggest that. I think the challenge conservatives will make against progressives is that they're is that they're too soft on extremism within minority groups because they like minority groups and are sympathetic to them that they they can be naive about about uh, extreme rather than mainstream voices and institutions can lack the cultural knowledge to know the difference conservatives can struggle for the language of drawing that boundary um, other people in national local government might struggle to know within different minority communities who exactly is on which side of the line of who's engageable who's a vocal critical opponent in the mainstream who's who's got connections that you should be wary of but is there do you think that there is a danger that the conservative party looks especially almost sort of obsessive about this particular type of extremism and using language where you know in talking about islamism that basically there is a suspicion from some people that that is just a way of essentially talking about Muslims and that there is now a sort of frame of reference or a theory within parts of the Conservative Party that actually being Muslim and being part of a Western democratic society is just somehow incompatible. And that idea has become more and more credence within parts of the Conservative Party and the right more generally. I think politicians are very careful in America and in Britain after 9-11 and you know, the Labour governments, David Cameron as well, to separate Muslim society from Islamist extremism. I think it's important to carry on doing that. I think then these sweeping claims about Islamism, I mean, what 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 the former Home Secretary, I think, got wrong when she was Home Secretary, when she's talking about hate marches, she wasn't doing what Rishi Sunak is doing better now, I think, which is saying, if you're using the democratic right to protest, there are boundaries around intimidation, or around prejudice, rather than calling the whole march prejudice. So I think there's a failure to get the to get the boundaries right when these very sweeping claims um, are made. The Conservative Party, you know, tried hard uh, a generation ago with British Muslim opinion hasn't 
hasn't really advanced very much in its social relationships, hasn't got relationships as a government. And so I think is heard by uh, mainstream Muslim opinion, by young British Muslims as well, as if as if the whole community is at risk of being some kind of fifth column if it's got views about Palestine, mm. rather than doing what the job of government is to do, which is to really get the boundary right between democratic disagreement about foreign policy and extreme views that are undermining uh, democracy or the rule of law. But it's that, that idea, Sundar, isn't it? You just mentioned it, this idea of a fifth column of the enemy within. I mean, don't we actually see basically that school of thought at work linking a lot of different stories at the moment? OK, so we had Lee Anderson and what he said about Sadiq Khan. We've had Suella Braverman, what she said about parts of the British state being controlled by Islamists. We hear more and more, as you say, conflation about people who are on the marches saying that they're Islamists, they're all Islamists, which is clearly not correct. But even something like we've seen with Michelle Donnellan in the last couple of days, with obviously with her having to pay money in terms of potential libel action to academics who she said were supporting Hamas, you're seeing this, I mean, you might call it almost a sort of moral panic about this idea that different parts of British society are in some way have an enemy within them that is Islamic or Hamas supporting or whatever it is. And I think that embattled sense, which can just be a political view that, you know, the liberal elites don't get it over Brexit and you're all too woke and so on, then being applied to community relations is dangerous. I think one of the things that's slightly um, gone wrong for the Conservatives here is that they've got something they like to do to the Labour Party, which is to take a leader of the Labour Party, Tony Blair, Keir Starmer, whoever it is, and say, but watch out for them because of the loony left they'll be running with. And it used to be, you know, activists for gay rights or, you know, the GLC or, you know, they'll be under the control of the Scottish nationalists. But if you start to say it's the Islamist threat that will be controlling a Labour government and what Lee Anderson was doing was making this very explicit electoral appeal to reform voters. But it wasn't just Khan that was under control of the Islamists, happens to be Muslim. Keir Starmer is under the control of the Islamists. He's almost using a kind of classic trope, you know, new labour, new danger thing, but applying it to community relations in a way that I think has underestimated dangers for community relations. The government has a rhetorical position that is correct, zero tolerance of all racism or prejudice, strong action on anti-Semitism, strong action on anti-Muslim hatred is what they like to call it. But they're not perhaps thinking about how the messages are received, about how they're characterising people they don't agree with. Um, disagreement rather than extremism. And that message might be perceived, you know, by dangerous elements of society whose threat perceptions are therefore are therefore increased. Just finally, I mean, I'm just very interested in this idea of the, the sort of panic around this stuff. I mean, what evidence actually is there to say that British society, the British state, we've heard accusations that, you know, basically there is a sort of constant threat of violence that is affecting how MPs behave, that there is uh, Islamist threats almost around every corner, they're in the marches and so on. This is the sort of picture that's being painted, not just by Conservative ministers, but you know, much of the press and so on, sort of day after day. What evidence is there for any of that, really? Hard evidence. We know that there are always, obviously, and there have been, as you say, for 20 years, is potential Islamist, Islamic-related terror threats. That's been the case for 20 years. What's new about any of this stuff? And is there any evidence that any of it has got worse? I think we're conflating different things. There's an ongoing threat of terrorism that you police with the security services. You have surveillance and you police people. There's then the debate about legal politics. Where are the boundaries of extremism? For example, you know, I used to call on UKIP in 2015 under Nigel Farage to throw out racists in the party if they had candidates that were wrong. I didn't. I didn't ask the BMP to throw out racists. It would be a pointless endeavour. So you wouldn't ask you wouldn't ask Hispert Tahir are quite like the BMP. They've been prescribed now, but they're a, they're an extreme group. Somebody else, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, it, it's much more or the George Galloway campaigns and so on. It's much more that point where you'd say if you want to be in the mainstream, have you policed your boundary? Lots of people are coming on your march, but are you getting rid of the right placards, prejudice, intimidation? So that's about that's about proper democratic behaviour. That's not the same thing as a as a terrorist threat that, that you've got from the far right or from or from Islamism. And then you've got the cultures you want, you know, within a political party. You know, the Conservative Party has got Muslim parliamentarians who don't think they take anti-Muslim prejudice seriously enough. When you're having these political debates, are they the kind of debate that somebody who's Muslim can take part with 
on equal terms if they want to join your party. The Labour Party failed that test terribly with um, British Jews who are left-leaning. The Conservative Party is basically not doing well in getting the voice right, not that there isn't a real threat of Islamist extremism at the fringes and broader debates about integration that you need to have were about foreign policy and domestic policy. They're not currently talking about it in a way that makes you know, Muslim conservatives, people who are Muslim or aren't conservative, feel like they're equal citizens of our country. And that's where you reinforce a them and us debate that is quite damaging to cohesion, confidence, democratic participation of British Muslims. Sunder, fascinating. Thanks so much for your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Right, that is it from us. Tomorrow we will be back with a big interview and an update to our story on Paul Marshall, one of the owners of GB News, would-be owner of The Telegraph. And of course, it is Joe Biden's State of the Union overnight, so we'll get to see what state he's in. And also, if we're lucky, we might just hear from this guy. Boob jobs, butt lifts and Botox. Thanks, John. Goodbye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 